All right, future captain here. Um, I just want to quickly say before I get into this, I'm sorry this took so long to get out. I have not been playing a lot of squad lately, nor have I been particularly motivated to make squad videos. In fact, I've been on, I think, over a two-month break from squad now, just because I've been so disheartened with the direction the game is taking, as well as the low quality of matches right now. I am still putting these out, but um, the motivation's not there as much, so this one's going to have a lot of standard B-roll footage going throughout, a little less uh, fancy graphics. That's normally what takes so long for me to get these out. I'm not a great editor, so by cutting those out, hopefully I can get these to you in a more timely manner, despite not playing squad quite as much lately. And with that said, let's get into it. We finally made it. The Advanced Guide. Today, we're going to be talking about attacking objectives. Now, I would like to start with offense rather than defense, because a lot of defense can simply be described as don't let them pull off this kind of offense, and the inverse isn't necessarily true, so that's going to be our starting point. Now, before we get going, I quickly want to reiterate what I said in the, I believe, first intermediate guide, where thinking about offense requires having a decent defense. If you see your defense and see that it's not exactly perfect and that it's fairly likely to fall and then you choose to go attack anyway, you don't really have the excuse of blaming the squad for losing the defense when you end up out of position. Sure, it might technically be their fault, but you should also be looking at them, judging them, and assessing whether you actually have the time to go through an attempt at a flag capture if the defense doesn't look ideal. Don't get into the habit of blaming others, blame yourself for not accurately assessing the situation and taking an unnecessary risk. That will help you improve a lot faster than playing the blame game. One other thing I would like to mention before we get into the specifics of attacking flags is that offense is often kind of essential. I think I very quickly stated that in the beginner guide, but didn't really clarify what I meant. It's quite simple, really. Um, most defenders do not have a long attention span. If you're in a game where it was, say, randomized defense and secure, and both teams back-capped their flags up to a certain point, and the offense objective was pretty far away for your team, so no one really decided to go for it, and they all kind of converged on the defense and sat there for 20 minutes, there is a 80% chance that right now the enemy's defense objective is either not being defended at all, or is being defended by three incredibly bored guys who aren't paying any attention whatsoever. Now, of course, if you're in a situation where your team decided to go for a defense-only strategy because they got their ass kicked at the offense objective, or, you know, if there are other circumstances or reasons why you might not want to go there, then uh, that changes things. But generally speaking, if you've been neglecting the attack objective for the majority of the game, then it's usually just ripe for the taking if you just get three guys there with a lottie truck. Now, without any further ado, let's actually get into attacking. The first important thing to know is that all engagements in squad are taking place between spawn points and spawn points, not groups of infantry. Any infantry that is unsupported by a spawn will usually be wiped and irrelevant in a matter of minutes, if not seconds, when they get into any kind of engagement. Any meaningful firefight is going to be backed by a spawn point on both sides. This here is kind of a model of how I view your typical HAB versus HAB engagement. Here, we're going to assume that both teams are aware of each other's presence and are actively trying to kill each other. We're also assuming that there's no definitive advantage in the terrain for either side, and that there's roughly an equal number of players fighting here on each team. As long as the engagement is mostly centered around the middle of these two HABs, it's going to be pretty difficult for either team to make progress. If one team does start pushing ahead though, they're going to acquire one advantage and one disadvantage. The advantage is that they're going to start encircling the enemy's position. There's a natural tendency for players of any first person shooter to attempt to flank, generally at a 45 degree angle from their spawn at most, when pushing towards enemies. The team pushing in is going to have more time to do this before being engaged and halted. The team on the back foot will be forced into contact fairly shortly after leaving their fob, giving them less of an ability to flank. Modern combat is heavily dependent on sightlines. When your average rifleman can kill anyone who displeases them within 300 meters in a shot or two, combat starts resembling an intense game of hide and seek. When somebody on this team leaves their hab, they have multiple potential directions of incoming fire that they need to be aware of, while only being able to focus on one direction at a time. Someone on this team, on the other hand, only has a narrow window they need to be watching and only has to worry about a fraction of the enemy players looking his way. 
There is a disadvantage as well though, respawns. The distance traveled for this team is greater than the distance traveled for this team. That means that in order to close the final gap here and proxy or destroy this hab, the progressing team has to deal with a perceived numerical advantage. This is heightened by the fact that the team on the back foot here is more likely to give up and respawn in a panicked attempt to prevent the hab from being overrun, and the progressing team is more likely to sit and wait for revives in order not to have to walk all the way back to their position. Now this isn't always strictly a disadvantage. It makes for a target-rich environment when you already have a sightline advantage, which can lead to a massive KD boost. And it can be exploited to give your team a ticket boost if you're in a stalemate style game and you need to be camping spawns. But generally speaking, the reason that either team is pushing the other one is because they're either trying to get to an objective here, or they're trying to delete this spawn outright to protect an objective over here. The natural tendency for blueberries to be content camping up and shooting into endlessly spawning waves of players is usually detrimental to those two goals, hence why I'm calling it a disadvantage. Sometimes this cautious behavior is enough that this team will be able to make a comeback, killing two or three key campers and then regaining territory through sheer spawning advantage while the attackers patiently wait for revives, bringing the engagement back to this neutral point. So let's move on to an example of actually attacking an objective. In this hypothetical example, let's say that the objective has been ignored until this point. Nobody is currently trying to take it and you are the first squad to arrive there. Most squad leaders will choose a direction they want to push from, set up a fob, and move in. When they see contact, they'll engage it, thus starting this standard firefight of squad. Now, once they're in this situation, most squad leaders overestimate their ability to influence this. A lot of people might wonder why I saved a topic as important as flag capturing and defending for the advanced guide. It's because most new squad leaders get way too enthusiastic while considering it. If squad leaders are playing active objectives and getting to the active objectives quickly, they're usually doing fine. If they're focusing way too much on influencing a firefight like this, they're usually neglecting those other responsibilities. You only have so much focus to go around when you're new. So many squad leaders think that they can either teach people to fight better or organize them in such a way that they will fight better naturally. They try to practice things like bounding overwatch, or teach the core principles of fire and maneuver to their squad and assign them to fire teams with predetermined roles, or they just give speeches about how they want callouts to be handled and that they want to practice a buddy system, or they want medics to stay behind everyone else, or really any other idea that they might have for making this group of people fight better than this group of people. First of all, a lot of this real-world doctrine stuff just isn't effective in squad. I'm going to get into the reasons for that later. And second of all, this is a huge waste of energy. It is incredibly idealistic. There are much, much simpler ways of dramatically increasing your effectiveness at attacking objectives without ever having to attempt to control this engagement or these people. Do not exhaust yourself by expending all of your time and focus trying to impose your doctrine or advice on these players and the hopes that the marginal effect it may be having is enough to push the engagement over the edge. Just break this cycle outright. Take a look at your goals here. You're trying to capture this flag, not kill this infantry. You've gotten yourself into a situation where you believe that this flag can't be captured unless you push through this infantry, but that's not strictly true. Engagements in squad are spawn points versus spawn points, so cut them off at the source, don't get distracted thinking that your goal is to kill. So how do you manage that? Let's start over from the beginning here. You're approaching the attack flag with some portion of your squad in the truck and some portion of your squad waiting for a spawn, as is normally the case later in the game. Your goal is to capture this flag, which is going to involve disabling the enemy spawn or spawns. The first step is to remember the mobility section of the guides. Stay out of the blueberry effect zone. Don't move directly between flags. Stay out of audio range of the furthest point you might imagine an enemy fob on the attack flag will be. Second step is to attempt to approach the flag as stealthily as you can. This usually isn't that difficult. Defenders, especially board defenders, have a one-track mind. There's a good chance that half of the defending squad is walking as far as they can towards the attack objective before their squad leader yells at them. The other half is either huddled up on the far edge of cap range looking in that direction, or just dicking around shuffling things up or lean dancing with each other in some building to alleviate the boredom. 
Most people in squad don't have the patience for a full 360 degree visual coverage of a defense objective. And that's if they even understand the importance of it or even have a squad leader who's trying to get them to understand the importance of it. Now, this lack of awareness is heightened if there's contact. Blueberries are predictable. Spawn, walk towards gunshots, die, repeat. If a squad is engaging the attack flag and you're moving to support them, use them as a distraction. You can also create your own distractions in the form of sending a single machine gunner or marksman to start calling attention to a different location before you attack, or coordinating with helicopters to make fake landings that defenders might immediately rush, or a variety of other options. Your imagination is your limit. If there is no contact, I strongly recommend pushing in from roughly the same direction of their main base or their next flag in line. However, terrain is usually the better deciding factor. Some flags have limited effective approaches, and you definitely want to be aiming for the approach that has the most concealment and, to a lesser extent, cover. On this example here, there is a juicy tree line on the eastern side that makes for a great concealed approach. Now when you're attacking, trucks are far superior to helicopters. Helicopters are incredibly noisy, and you're going for a stealthy approach here. If you land a helicopter inside of audio range of the objective, by the time the helicopter touches down, you hop out, you place the radio where you need it, the helicopter dump supplies, you get that fob going, and you start shoveling it, the enemies who are on defense are already halfway towards running towards the noise to come kill you. That's a helicopter flanking way southwest. I hope by you, uh, think them. Yeah, I'm running to meet him if he lands. Oh yeah, he's playing real low. He's gonna land. He's doing a J turn. He's gonna land here. He has a full squad. Everybody start pushing and zerking. Taking most of the contact on the southeast. Roger. Oh, uh, south. Marking it as head. If you land them outside of audio range, which is close to one kilometer, I really can't remember the exact number. The amount of time that you'll spend walking and the uselessness of your spawn will entirely negate the advantage of arriving there quicker than if you took a truck. You're also losing the flexibility of having a vehicle there with you after the fact. When you're driving, make sure that you drive into the area where you're going to be setting your fob in a straight line. Do not cut across audio range of other parts of the objective. Once you're nearly there, cut your engine and coast the truck as close as you feel comfortable with, which will get closer and closer with time as you grow more confident. The closer that you get your spawn, the easier the fight will be, but don't fly too close to the sun and get detected before you're set up and pushing in. Now comes the important part. You do not have much control over how well your squad is going to fight, as I mentioned before. That's very important to remember. But what you do have nearly complete control over is where your squad will fight and when your squad will fight. By coming in from the most concealed location and choosing the location of your hab, you have chosen where your squad will fight. Now the second important part is to control when. Long ago, when I was new to squad leading, before I understood the predictable nature of blueberries or the importance of spawn networks, I made a simple observation. The closer you get to a flag before engaging enemies, the more likely you are to take it. Tell everyone in your squad to follow you and not to shoot at anything until they are shot at. Make sure that you make that last point crystal clear, because it will be the difference between a successful or an unsuccessful attack. I like to request that they stay single file, but this is um, my personal preference. By moving together, you're minimizing your footprint, but it comes with the disadvantage of decreasing your combat effectiveness. If you get spotted, you can be wiped by a single machine gun. As I said earlier, combat is heavily dependent on sight lines, and you're essentially blinding yourselves by limiting yourselves to one perspective and moving through the densest concealment you can find. If somebody shoots prematurely or you're spotted early, you're in a really bad situation. It's up to you to decide whether or not you value the decreased chance of being spotted enough to risk being in that compromised of a position if you're engaged early, but I personally think the risk is worth it. Um, once again, totally up to you guys. If you make it in without being seen, you are very, very likely to immediately spot their spawn. You'll be proxying it before the enemy even knows they're under attack. If you manage to dig down or to plant a C4 charge on the radio, or even just dig the hab down one layer, or if you're even just keeping two people alive within 30 meters to proxy the hab, every single person you kill from that point on is either respawning someone further out that you haven't discovered yet, or is completely wiped off the flag. You have won this fight before it even began. 
you'll also most likely be moving your cap in your favor immediately. All you need to worry about now are what remains of the spawn network and making sure that you completely wipe the spawn that you are now controlling. Once again, you can't control how well your guys are going to fight, but you can do a hell of a lot by controlling when and where. Even if you fail to disable the hab, you're still starting the exact same engagement that we've talked about earlier from the advantageous position. You're closer to their spawn than they are to yours. You're already at this point. You already have the sightline advantage, and you're probably just outside of proxy range. It's also entirely possible that the enemy is still confused as to which direction they need to be pushing to bring the fight to your hab. It's possible that this situation will resolve itself in your favor in a pretty short amount of time. But... I never count on that. Anytime an engagement of mine breaks down to this basic model that I've talked about, I consider it to be a loss. I might be pleasantly surprised if I end up wrong, but I'm still always going to be looking at alternatives under the assumption that it will fail. If my attack did not manage to take the flag, I am not ever going to try to recover it. I am going to use it as a distraction for my next attempt. Now, all of the attention is focused on my new hab. The waves of players are fighting, and there's a ripe new flank to be exploited. At this point, I still have my truck on my fob, with a meat shield protecting it in the form of this fob. What I'm going to do is attempt to get one or two members of my squad to join me on that truck and place a new spawn. I don't want to take too many people, or my new spawn will promptly be overrun and I will lose both tickets and my distraction. By the time I'm either setting my rally point or hab, depending on if I had supplies prepared on the truck, I will request that everyone who's dead gets ready to spawn on the new location. It is possible that in the process of this I will lose my old hab, but even in death it's providing a great distraction for my new attempt to stealthily dive bomb their hab, and if it holds up, the distraction is even better. Even if I fail again, and I now have this same model on two flanks, I'm still increasing my line of sight advantage by allowing my squad to focus on one point while forcing the enemy to remain aware of two separate flanks. It is an advantage in and of itself to be pinching a point like this. And even if the enemy hab is still active, I now have a fairly successful push on this end, putting constant pressure on it, hopefully allowing the firefight over here to once again start to make progress. This is 90% of my flag attacking strategy. Not winning fights, but bypassing them. Staying mobile and dumping waves of troops from as many fresh directions as possible. It's easy to do with the tools available to you as an SL, and it's much more effective than focusing on a single engagement and trying to improve it. But it is not perfect. Sometimes, especially early on, you're going to lose your truck. A ton of my squad leading revolves around driving endlessly in unarmored trucks, which of course has its dangers. Now I don't lose them way too often, because I generally have a pretty solid understanding of where the enemy is at any given point, but I have been heavily recommending my strategies throughout my guides, while not always taking into consideration that having good map awareness requires more hours than some of the people watching my guides have. Even with experience of knowing how to thread the needle between dangerous areas and how to keep just out of audio range at all times, sometimes I get overconfident or unlucky and run into either experienced defenders or just people dicking around in the middle of nowhere. Other times, you're just unfortunate enough to run into some armor making long flanks or you'll get spotted by helicopters loitering around objectives. Sometimes the map forces your hand and only gives you a couple of options and you have to choose the least shitty one and hope it works. Should I spend over 5 minutes driving around the hills of Kohat and hope the defense doesn't fall before I can even make it to the attack objective? Or should I risk a fob somewhere that enemies might already be occupying? The more experience you have, the less often you'll misjudge situations like this, and the less often you're going to be losing your trucks. But if you do, you have to try your best to mitigate the damage. Either recover your truck or destroy it. My playstyle increases the risk of vehicles being lost behind enemy lines, so it is a real issue that you'll find yourself facing if you follow my guides and follow my advice. If you do recover your vehicle, you're back in business. If it's destroyed, it'll respawn within 3 minutes and you'll be able to grab it at main relatively shortly and continue encircling and prodding at the defenders. Even if your initial hab fails in the downtime, don't be too discouraged. There is always a certain advantage to having a fresh start. Combat tends to bog down plans, decrease flexibility, and lead to tunnel vision. 
my techniques are a constant attempt to break that routine and create fresh, cohesive, effective attacks as regularly as possible. You may have lost 15 tickets and a potential distraction, but you've probably gained back the focus of your entire squad as they all spawn back at main ready for a fresh attempt, rather than trying to manage their respawns while they're all distracted by combat and barely listening to you. In other situations, you'll be successfully placing your fobs, but every single attack will fail. This could be the result of many things. Sometimes the numbers are just too stacked against you. You may give your squad the perfect flank, get on top of their fob, and start shoveling the radio only to be entirely overwhelmed by the horde of blueberries rushing back once they see their fob proxied. Other times, you'll just be up against good defenders, who are keeping an eye out in all directions and engage you far from the flag, ruining your attempts to place close attack fobs. There are ways to mitigate this, but they start veering into the whole increase your squad's effectiveness territory that I've been warning you about. It isn't easy with blueberries. But, let's say you're confident and you want to give it a shot, or you have a group of people that you play with who are willing to learn and apply some basic strats. I'll walk you through the way I approach taking down a fob with my clan. All of this can be explained on the fly to blueberries as the situation demands it, with varying results on effectiveness. First of all, the combat engineer is a god-tier kit. Spawn killing is the foundation of offense and a huge part of defense, so no matter where your squad is going, a combat engineer is going to be incredibly useful. So some quick tips and stats before we dive in. C4 will take a radio most of the way down. It's enough to make the hab unspawnable until the radio is rebuilt, but not enough to destroy it. 12 digs is enough to take the radio down to being one-hittable by C4. Now one visual stage is 16 digs, so it's best just to shoot for that number so that you have a visual identification that you've made it past the point where the C4 is going to take it down the rest of the way. Now IEDs will insta-kill radios without any digs required. Um, a single C4 will not take down a HAB, even a single layer. It will still be spawnable after you play C4 on it. You should almost never use C4 on HABs. The best approach is normally to place C4 first on the radio, and then move to the opposite end to avoid the hitbox of the C4 while you dig it down with your shovel. The enemy can technically walk in and remove the C4 off of that radio, but it is very hard to hit the C4 hitbox and not the radio's hitbox. They are more likely to dig the radio down further before the C4 goes off. Now if you're ever in the situation where you're trying to defend a radio that has C4 placed on it, the best thing to do is build it back to full health and just accept that you're sacrificing your life to save this radio. Chances are, if you're pushing to kill a spawn, you're going to spot the hab before the radio. If you spot the radio and it is separate from the hab, that is the easier target, but generally you'll be pushing the hab first. My first step is to use the radial menu to put an observe mark on the hab the moment I get eyes on. This lets everyone know exactly where it is, allows for an easy map marker, and most importantly, it allows everyone to see their distance to the hab. This is essential for keeping the hab proxied. If that's your goal, tell everyone to stay within 30 meters. You'll need at least two people alive within 30 meters of the hab to keep the enemy from spawning. If you have a combat engineer, you do have the option of sending him in first before proxying the hab. If you're looking at an inactive flag with no current attackers, this can be the best option. The moment that hab is proxied, people are going to start coming back. You still have some time before you're going to be able to locate that radio and put your engineer on it. If you send the engineer in alone, there's a decent chance you can find the radio, place C4, and start digging before the enemy is aware of your presence. The first indication that the defenders will have that they are in trouble is that they will see the radio health creep down, and that's exactly when your cue to push will be. You'll be proxying the hab before the enemy has reasonable time to react to the new threat, supporting and covering your engineer while he digs the radio a bit to finish the job, and you'll pretty much have that thing completely destroyed before the enemy has even had time to process what's happening. Now the risk to that particular strategy is that you're sending the most important person in your squad at the moment to search around for something while enemies are potentially spawning right next to him. If nobody on the enemy team is respawning because that flag hasn't yet been attacked, then the risk is slim. If the hab might be active, however, it's probably best just to dive vomit with your full squad and cover your engineer while he searches around the proxied hab. 
Similarly, if you have a full squad waiting to pounce on that hab, you can usually rest assured knowing that you'll be able to cover your engineer effectively for long enough through sheer numbers, even if you're letting the enemy know where you're at sooner rather than later. This is also a good option if you don't fully trust your engineer and are having to explain things to him as you go. If you have limited people sneaking around to kill the hab and don't have your entire squad available, it's probably best to sneak the engineer in alone again, even if there are people respawning on that hab. Stealth is going to be a bigger advantage than one or two rifles covering your engineer while the entire enemy team is made aware of what you guys are doing. Either way, once you're within proxy range of the hab, you have another decision to make. Usually, the radio will be close by and you'll get audio on it from somewhere within proxy range. If you're able to get your engineer on the radio and give him sufficient cover while still being within 30 meters of the hab and keeping it proxied, focus on the radio. Sometimes, the radio will be inside of the hab itself. This will prevent you from digging it, since the hitbox for the hab will completely be covering the radio. What a lot of people don't realize about this is that it can fuck over the enemy team more than it fucks over your engineer. If you place your C4 on the radio, when it detonates, it'll take the health down to the point where the hab isn't spawnable, and the enemy team isn't going to be able to dig that radio back to a spawnable health without first entirely removing their own hab to access the radio's hitbox. If you combine this with digging their hab down from the outside after placing the C4, you can still destroy the fob nearly as quickly. You won't dig down the hab so far that you won't be protected from the internal blast, but you will dig it down just far enough that the C4 will take it down to the stakes for you, which leaves you with a pretty small cleanup job of removing those stakes and then getting the rest of the radio health down. Alternatively, if you have a rifleman available, two C4s on the radio will take care of it just fine at the cost of the 50 ammo. The first explosion won't even take the hab down a layer, so it'll still be safe to be around when the second C4 goes off. Of course, this is also applicable to radios that aren't covered by the hab, if for some reason that's going to be a faster option than risking the last digs. If you can't find the radio or it's too far away, then you want to dig the hab down one layer, at least, so you can comfortably leave it without having enemies spawning behind you so that you can focus on the radio. I wouldn't dig the hab down all the way, because that takes a lot more time, and it also allows any squad leader within radio range to place another one if they have the supply on standby. Now, if you don't have a combat engineer, then the name of the game is proxying and eventually disabling the hab. It's going to take a lot longer to destroy that radio, so you need to make damn sure that people aren't respawning while you're doing it. The first step is to get two people within 30 meters of the hab and get a steady proxy. If you're swinging with a full squad and you haven't been spotted yet, you can try to get everyone rushing the hab and a couple of people shoveling it down, while everyone else covers them and kills the handful of people that will inevitably come back to defend it once it gets proxied. Now if you're in a trickier situation where you're either outnumbered or you're already in combat before you've reached the hab, you need to go for a stealth proxy. Get two people to hide within 30 meters and prioritize their life above everything else. Absolutely no engaging the enemy, unless they are directly on top of you. Let everyone else push past the two hidden proxiers and attempt to clear out the infantry. Every enemy that you kill is completely out of the fight. Even if everyone is shooting like shit and dying twice for every kill, you will still inevitably make progress as long as you have a steady proxy. Now, everyone's natural tendency in this situation is to push up and join the fight. Stealth proxying is not fun, but make sure that people aren't throwing away literally all of the progress you've made by dying and immediately allowing a full squad sitting on the spawn screen to spawn in the moment their fob is unproxied. Most people in squad are not good at controlling a steady proxy, and it really can make the difference if you're not periodically throwing away all of the progress that you're making. Once you have a solid stealth proxy, and you have taken the hab down one layer, then you can afford to search and prioritize the radio. Now, all of this applies to failed attempts as well. Sometimes you'll lose your truck, you'll be eyeing the timer for the respawn, and you'll be forced to work off of a single spawn. Other times, you'll just get incredibly close with your first push, but not quite manage it. You still have an advantage and don't want to write it off as a complete loss yet, while you're still so close to proxying the hab, so you don't want to take the risk of going and building another spawn. Other times, you're just in circumstances where you can't really afford to try something else. This is common on super linear maps, where there's really only one or two half-decent angles to hit an objective from, and you're already using both. 
Sometimes there are situations where you're just going against really good defenders, or a massive number of defenders. No matter how many attempts you make to sneak in, there's either a smart player there watching the flank, or so much infantry that you're just spotted by chance every time. This is common on Invasion, where a huge amount of infantry on both teams is fighting over a single objective. Now, I really hate these situations, and I've already explained my philosophy on attacks. I consider a failed attempt to stealthily wipe their fob a failed attack. Games like these essentially force me to accept that the fight is going to come down to an actual fight between two teams or two groups of infantry, and not down to a series of maneuvers that I can try to orchestrate to attempt to remove the enemy team from the equation by wiping spawns. Now, I generally find myself in a state of pretty constant frustration in these situations, even if we're doing fairly well, simply because I find my control over the situation slipping and my usual strategies to be ineffective. If you find yourself here, there are still things you can do to increase your squad's effectiveness, regardless of what I said about not prioritizing that earlier. First of all, you have to know when to call it quits. My strategy that I've laid out here is incredibly expensive when it comes to tickets. A successful capture might cost two habs and two squad wipes, totaling close to 40 tickets for a 60 ticket objective. Now if you kill enemy habs in the process, and maybe a couple of squads when you eventually capture it, you are of course lessening that ticket blow and still getting something close to your 60 tickets for the capture, but it's very high risk and high reward. If you end up in a stalemate after several failed attempts against good defenders, you're going to be pretty close to spending more tickets than that flag is worth, especially if you're not getting a great KD as a squad. Of course, calling it quits and leaving isn't always an option. Sometimes that flag is your only hope for a game win. Sometimes your team is too uncoordinated to commit to a defense-only strategy and will continue to bleed tickets with or without your help, so it's best to double down and at least stand a chance of capturing rather than letting your team lemming into the cap over and over and lose your remaining tickets. And of course, sometimes you're playing a game mode like Invasion or Insurgency and simply leaving the objective isn't an option. If you're forced to stay and duke it out in a single direction, the biggest thing you can do is encourage aggression. I've talked about the natural tendencies for squad players to turtle up in previous guides. Sometimes it comes from inexperience, having no clue what to do when you're shot at or what to do about it. Other times it comes from the preservation of KD, prioritizing one's life over one's movements. Most commonly, it comes from a misunderstanding about what is important. People look at the firefight through the lens of real conflicts. In the real world, cautious behavior in combat makes a lot of sense. If you start breaking down the advantages of caution versus aggression, caution generally wins out. The goal is to keep soldiers alive while killing enemies, and that's best accomplished by taking things slow, coordinating to watch every angle, covering each other's movements, and being thorough with searching the unknown. All of this is demonstrated in most modern military doctrine. In Squad, this is almost entirely a waste of time. As I've said, it's not about killing enemies or staying alive. Respawns are cheap and fast. It's about dealing with spawn points, which requires proximity, which requires movement. In an ideal situation, you would just leave your hab and sprint towards theirs in a straight line. Now, due to the fact that usually there are enemies there preventing you from doing this, it's usually not an option. However, you cannot forget that movement is still the underlying goal. Maybe you need to flank to avoid their fire. Maybe you need to throw smokes to conceal your movements. Maybe you need to dive behind some solid cover and call out a contact that's engaging you so that somebody else with different sightlines can kill them and allow you to push again. Maybe you're forced to peek him and attempt to get the kill for yourself and risk it. Maybe every now and again, the best option for getting the most amount of people forward in a timely manner is actually to sit on a hill with a machine gun and turtle in order to get the drop on people poking out of windows in order to help a bigger portion of your squad close the gap. Whatever the situation is, you cannot forget that the underlying goal is movement. If you take fire and you dive into cover to save your life, what you're doing is you're protecting the distance you've covered. If you die, you would need to walk that distance again, thus putting you at a disadvantage when it comes to movement. However, if you turtle up to avoid fire, and you stay there for longer than it would have taken to do a 30 second respawn and return to the position that you are in, you may as well have died and picked a less contested flank to approach upon respawning. 
you likely would have covered more ground in less time. For this reason, the moment that you've been pinned, you need to be exhausting every resource you have for dealing with the situation as soon as possible. Smoke, covering fire from a friendly, peeking it and risking it for the headshot, whatever it takes to get moving again sooner rather than later. This is why squad leaders universally hate the phrase, I'm pinned, and treat it like a shitty excuse, not a valid reason to stop moving. If you are pinned, you need to either unpin yourself or die trying as soon as possible, or we're never going to make any progress. Better to die a handful of times and make it into proxy range on their hab, than to survive for 10 minutes but never make it within 100 meters. Now, before everyone starts bashing your keyboards, raging against how having your squad bunny hopping from bush to bush with smoke grenades in their hands isn't exactly a brilliant offense, I do agree. The ideal push is obviously subject to debate and hard to definitively prove, but it probably involves the majority of your squad spreading out, those in the center taking the brunt of the fire, those on the flanks turning to engage when essential and pushing when not, while having possibly a machine gun in a key position overwatching the entire ordeal, playing more cautiously and immediately reacting to oncoming fire. Maintaining movement in less shot at, and spreading wide enough to have several options for bypassing or flanking the enemies doing the shooting. A strong priority on closing gaps and proxying habs, while also allowing for a minor amount of cautious behavior from select individuals to assist others in closing the gap more effectively. The trouble is that you're never going to accomplish that level of micromanagement in a squad without some combination of serious practice time and a willingness to give up valuable time in the beginning by organizing for a push rather than immediately starting to close the gap the moment your spawn is constructed, thus going against the fast-paced nature of squad. There have been times where I've seen people who are newer squad leaders posting asking for help on Reddit or on the forums, and you get these people replying talking about shit like fire teams and formations, and it really kind of pisses me off because it has almost no valid application for a squad. Formations should be loose guidelines followed at the individual level that can be fluid and dynamic based on circumstance. A formation should really only be a natural tendency to gradually spread out an appropriate amount in relation to your teammates, allow the medics to be overtaken and bring up the rear, and maybe scout out a position for a machine gun. It really comes down to the competence and spatial awareness of each individual. Formations shouldn't be the squad leader spending two minutes of incredibly valuable time micromanaging everyone into a specific pattern with cute fireteam color coding, only to have it all fall apart upon first contact because nobody gives a shit whether or not they're maintaining a perfect inverted wedge while taking 7.62 to the face. This guide is mostly aimed at people who are leading blueberries, and oftentimes the best way you can hope to improve their performance is by never stopping encouraging aggression, discouraging turtling, and running out in front with smoke grenades like a fucking madman trying to prevent them from getting too shot up, or flanking wide to lay a spawn and start camping or proxying the spawn to give them a slight advantage they need to push up. The more people you can get mimicking that behavior, the better chance you actually have of making progress. You'll never manage to convince all nine of them to rush. In an ideal world, you'll get just enough of them doing it that you're actually getting some good teamwork going on between the stubborn turtles popping off shots at heads and the rushers drawing fire, and your offense will start to slightly resemble what we've just talked about. It's all about working with what you have and molding it into something effective. You don't have the luxury of starting from scratch and getting to take eight people through a boot camp while you explain all your philosophies about the game. Usually the best way to mold an average squad that you're working with to do something that performs decently in the current meta is just to keep yelling for aggression and movement. Now, we've talked about doing your best to bypass combat, we've talked about trying to get your squad to do the best in combat when that's not an option, and now we have to talk about this from a command perspective, from a strategic level, coordinating with other squads to be as effective as you possibly can while attacking. Now there are several different ways to be doing this. You can be coordinating with armor, mortars, commander abilities, helicopters, and the like. Now, I tend to steer away from trying to coordinate with other squads in the earlier stages of an attack, outside of making sure everybody knows that I'm leaving the defense and making sure that somebody is going to stay on it. The reason for this is that oftentimes I find myself put at a disadvantage when others get involved too soon. 
If I am pushing a flag and a random blueberry finds their way into my truck or spawns on my hab, I could be entirely fucked if they don't listen to us and decide to start lighting up the first person they see. If an overenthusiastic helicopter pilot decides to immediately bring me supplies once I put my radio down, they've just advertised my FOB's location before I've even located the enemies. Same thing if a BTR rolls up to support us immediately after we dismount from our truck. If a mortar squad decides to start dropping smokes on the western part of the objective, well, I appreciate the sentiment, but ultimately it's just alerting the enemy of our presence and location before needed. Now, once things start going south, that could be exactly what you need. I'm not going to go over every little thing that could potentially help you, because most of it is pretty obvious. Pinch the objective between two squads, call artillery and mortars down on spawns, get vehicles to find elevated positions to engage the point, or dive bomb full infantry squads at their gates, uh, maybe hot drop some engineers with a helicopter to go to their fob, the usual armchair general stuff that anyone can theorize about and try to put into motion. When I was newer to the game, I used to view that kind of coordination as endgame content, the peak of squad leading effectiveness. And on the surface level, it does look really fucking cool. But in practice, now that I have thousands of hours under my belt, at best, this kind of coordination looks more like a desperate, time-intensive, last-ditch effort to overcome roadblocks than brilliant displays of teamwork that overwhelm the enemy. And at worst, it can look like a detriment to my chance of success if they come too early. That may seem a little bit cynical, but it's not shaped out of bitterness, it's just the way that I've learned to have the most success with the game. As a quick side note, this kind of inter-squad coordination can be extremely practical on certain maps. If you take Talil outskirts, for example, defending a point like Batha on Talil can be incredibly easy with a little bit of preparation. Two or three ATGMs in elevated positions on rooftops covering every direction will make most approaches in a Lodgy or helicopter simply suicide. The only real area to sneak into this objective is through the low ground of the river, which often takes you past al Qadir, which is usually a contested point if Batha is already an active objective anyway. It's either that, or you want to ride the north border to this river, which isn't as concealed by foliage and is usually in view of a northern toe. Even when these approaches succeed, you're usually building pretty shitty fobs to be assaulting from, either in this riverbed or just on the outskirts of town if you get lucky and make it all the way up. Now the answer here is usually to try something else. Get a fake landing from a helicopter, even if it's suicide for the pilot, while you rush the other end. Get an APC or two to cover you and fire at the toes while you dash in and attempt to set up as close to solid cover as you possibly can. Or coordinate with other infantry squads to attack at the same time from two different angles to increase your chance of survival. Any of these are decent options, and there are probably better ones out there, depending on how willing your team is to cooperate. And this is one of the rare opportunities where you're going to be relying on that for success. At least if you're going against half-decent defenders, anyway. But ultimately, a combination of the fast pace of squad and the amount that you want to be avoiding combat makes inner squad communication and coordination just not the most effective way to go about attacking flags. I wish it was different, believe me. I'm not sitting here trying to say that this is ideal game design and this is the way I've always wanted it to be. I would love to be playing a game that came down to small unit tactics and coordination between squads for any chance at success, but that's just not the way that squad is in the current version, and I am making these guides to help make as effective as possible as squad leaders out of the people watching them, and I'm not going to lie and try to give an idealist view on peak squad gameplay, when in reality, it's quite different. Anyway, in review, when you're attacking flags, you want to start as small scale as possible and as direct as possible. You want to avoid combat at all costs and do your best to manage to kill spawn points before ever taking contact. If that doesn't work because of the skill level of the enemy team, and you have tried multiple times with no success, then you are going to be forced to engage in combat to capture that objective. And now you need to start thinking about how to make your squad the most effective at combat, which is a very difficult task but can involve strategic thinking when it comes to taking down fobs, explaining things to combat engineers on the fly, or just encouraging aggression and discouraging turtling as much as you possibly can with your blueberries. And if that doesn't work, then you're going to be forced to attempt to cooperate with the rest of the team to either get more people there, go for a defensive only strategy, get mortar support, commander support, vehicle support, 
Whatever kind of support you can get from your team, as long as it's in a timely manner, can help you in this circumstance. Don't forget the part I said about a timely manner. In the same way that in the beginning I was talking about how you are overestimating your ability to make your squad fight more effectively, and instead need to do things yourself to try to make them fight in better circumstances, the same goes for the team. You will always overestimate your ability to quickly and decisively communicate with the team and accomplish goals that you have in mind. And instead, you should generally be relying on your squad as much as possible first, and then going to those extremes when necessary. Bear in mind with all of that, that 70 to 80% of my attacks stop at the first step. They usually involve me just continuing to prod at new angles until I find my opening and kill the spawn. And usually that is successful with me. Most newer squad leaders tend to look at this the complete wrong way, and start to think about how they can be the most effective both with their squad and with the team, before they really start thinking about what their underlying goals are and the easiest way to accomplish those. I actually started a thread on Reddit with a very simple basic question of how do you assault flags, and I was kind of looking for those typical armchair general responses, the kind of fire team, bounding overwatch, generic, milsim-esque kind of stuff. And I obviously put in there a little warning that I would be reviewing them and that I'd probably put their Reddit names up on this video. But much to my surprise, I actually got a lot of very, very, very good answers from um, other experienced members of the community who understand a lot of the concepts that I've talked about in this video. So they ended up kind of showing me and telling me, and I don't really get to have the uh, fun arguments to pick apart and demonstrate what I just said. Um, the only question I really have for you guys now is, where the fuck are you on my teams? <laughs> But um, yeah, most of the responses are really good. There are a couple of ones out there that are a little bit iffy, but I didn't really want to just pick apart one or two and kind of single out those individuals. So I'm just going to leave a link to the thread, and you can see some people's slightly differing opinions, but um, largely similar concepts if you're looking for other people's perspective besides just my own on what is and isn't important. So that thread will be in the description if you guys want to give it a look, and thank you to everyone for participating, and uh, please come play on Fear and Terror servers, because I need more of you in my life. Now, one last thing to mention. The spawn point, of course, isn't always inside the objective itself. All of my examples have relied on that being the case. There are a few different circumstances you can run into. For example, sometimes there will be a spawn in the center that you take down, but then there will also be an external spawn. And when you take the spawn point and start to capture the objective, enemies will start coming in from a new angle. Now I usually consider this to be essentially switching from offense to defense, where now you have a cap to control, and you also have attackers coming at you, so I'm going to cover that in the defense guide, which will be next. But sometimes you will either take out the centralized fob, or there never will be a centralized fob, and you'll be left in a situation where there are two teams with two external fobs fighting over a cap point. Now if you're attacking and they already have that cap range secured, you have essentially two different options. You can either prioritize cap range, or you can prioritize the spawn. Now if you have all of the time in the world, I would strongly recommend prioritizing the spawn point. Even if you do capture the objective, you're not really making it sustainable. There's still a chance that the enemy can take it back from you, or that the enemy can then focus on your spawn and wipe you off of the objective and make your situation entirely unsustainable. It's usually best to still cut them off at the source, prioritize that, and then prioritize the objective afterwards. But you don't always have that luxury. If your defense starts failing, you might be in a really bad situation if you don't immediately secure cap range. Even if you're just securing a double neutral, it could still be very important in making sure that a majority of your team isn't out of position when that flag fails. As long as you have a double neutral, they're still working towards the goal. Similarly, if you have people overextending on the offense flag with a failed rush or something of that sort, it could be very, very important to prioritize your cap range so that you actually get the flag and allow those people to make progress rather than forcing all of them to relocate if they are even willing to. The outside circumstances can strongly affect how much you need to prioritize cap. Another thing to consider is tickets, of course. If you are close to losing, you might really need to prioritize hitting that objective just to get enough tickets to stay above ground. But if none of these are applicable, once again, strongly recommend going for the external fob. Now there are two other circumstances I want to talk about. Sometimes when I choose to attack from an unexpected direction, it ends in me stumbling right on top of their hab. Now with my clan, we just call this the BHM hab their hab technique, which I you know is very creative. 
where essentially I'm building and destroying at the exact same time because I have experienced members of my clan that can usually handle that kind of information overload. You may not have as much success with that with blueberries, but you still definitely want to be trying to take down that fob as quickly as possible and get yours up at the same time. And then I pretty much just accept that immediately what happened here was I killed an external fob, which is probably going to give me an advantage, and I created a distraction. At this point, I completely expect this to be a stalemate, and I'm working on alternatives. The advantage being that I've both created a distraction and disabled a spawn point. The other situation is that you're going against an active defense. Actual good defenders. Now this is rare. <laughs> With the servers I play on, I pretty much know everyone by name who I might run into on the enemy team who might put up a good enough defense for me to have to worry about this. But if you're looking at a defense where they have a hab inside of the objective as well as two external habs and probably rally points, you're getting to the situation where one attacking squad, even if they're circling the objective and taking habs down almost entirely uncontested, is going to take such an incredible amount of time to spawn wipe an enemy that they have all of the opportunity in the world to be both attacking your spawns and creating other spawns as theirs go down. An active defense like this is incredibly hard to overcome through spawn wiping, and is oftentimes going to come down to a bit of a numbers game. This is pretty common in Invasion as well, where not only is it difficult to get to the spawns and spawn wipe the enemy because of the number of enemies, but also because of the number of different spawns. In this situation, sometimes I just give up on spawn wipes entirely, and focus on building my own spawn network to be as inclusive as possible, and trying to prioritize dive bombing cap range. There are so many ways for this to go wrong though. If there are truly active defenders, they're going to be killing your spawns even as you take cap range. And if your team starts to prioritize their spawns, you might get yourself into a perpetual spawn fight game, where you're taking down a spawn, losing a spawn, building a spawn, having the enemy build a spawn, and all of this fighting is taking place outside of the objective while five or six people determine the actual cap status of the flag. There's not always a 100% correct answer here. Sometimes I'll dive bomb cap range in an attempt to at least move the flags along and allow enemies to push the next one, thus taking the pressure off of this incredibly well defended point. Sometimes I'll focus primarily on actually camping and defending haps, which is pretty rare for me. It's very, very rare that I actually incentivize people to defend a hab, but if I can keep a certain amount of a distraction on their spawns as they spawn, and keep them from sneaking a single combat engineer into my spawn, I may have enough people left over to influence cap range while also not getting bogged down by the sideshows going on around. It's a complicated situation and you won't have to deal with it often because of the relatively low skill level of the average squad leader. But um, feel free to talk about strategy for this if it's a situation that you've gotten yourself into and you're a more experienced SL. This is a discussion that's definitely worth having since it is a more complicated aspect of squad. And it's not something where I can simply outright give you an option that I find works 90% of the time. Anyway, that just about concludes this. Um, thank you everyone for watching and I will see you guys in the next one, which will be defense focused and will be the final video of the base squad leading tutorial series.